My name is Mark Elias from New Albany Realty. I'm pleased to welcome this strong woman who's an expert communicator, who's also a coach for individuals and businesses seeking to improve their communication skills. A TEDx, TEDx coach, she has had many transformations by focusing on her personal growth and development while maintaining a life of health and balance. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Gina Molinari. Hey there, Gina. Hi, Mark. How are you? It's great to see you. Good to see you, too. I love your enthusiasm. While we were on the phone during our kind of pre-interview last week, I got off the telephone and I felt more, I felt more energized. Oh, that makes me happy. Thank you. Yeah. That's what I really want for people is like, I want to be able to be somebody who can make other people feel more alive like themselves. And it's not because of me, but it's because I help bring out the best in them. So thank yeah. you. Huge yeah. Problem. You um, are a conduit for their own growth and development. Thank you. I love that word too, conduit. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> so, hey, I'm really interested about this TEDx. For those people who don't know TEDx, it is actually, you explain it because you're in the program. Yeah, yeah. So TED, I mean, people know what TED Talks are, right? They're these, you know, big 20-minute sort of conversations. They're meant to uh, really speak into ideas of technology, education, and design. That's what TED stands for. It's not a person. It's an acronym. So TEDx is on the more local level where you can get a license to put on a TED-like event. That's what the X is, is that it's not technically like the big umbrella of TED, but it's a local licensed version for you to put on one and have to follow all these rules to make sure that you're aligned with the brand basically and so that's why you'll see you know TEDx Hilliard, TEDx Columbus, TEDx Cincinnati, TEDx Dayton like whatever it is that's the local chapter of whatever it is they're doing and every year you apply for it so if you want an ongoing thing you know it can be but it's a matter of creating your own sort of local community experience with the same idea of challenging people's ideas about technology education design and it's ideas worth spreading so I got involved in this about a year ago now, you know, I'm somebody who does public speaking coaching. As a communication coach, I cover a bunch of different facets of communication, but speaking is definitely a prominent one. And I just happened to meet somebody at a, an event who, you know, she's kind of a local celebrity, actually, Michaela Hunt, if you're familiar with her. So I met her at an event and she was on the board for this particular local TEDx chapter. And, you know, the next week she called and said after her committee meeting that they were looking for more coaches. And she remembered that I, you know, introduced myself as someone who does this work. And she said, you know, we'd love to have you as a coach. And I thought that was an amazing opportunity. And I got to, you know, coach a couple of people through that. And it's just such a rewarding experience. I mean, it's a volunteer thing, whether you're a speaker or a coach or somebody who's even on the board of the event, it is a volunteer opportunity, which is something not a lot of people know, but there's such gravitas that comes with that brand of TED, right? Like it, everybody wants to be a TED speaker, a TEDx speaker. Um, and I, you know, I, even, even in your bio reading before we jumped on here, you know, you said I was a TEDx speaker and I was like, no, no, TEDx coach. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to mislead people to say that, you know, I've done a TEDx talk because it is such a, such a reward rewarding and honorary thing. Like I haven't gotten to do mine yet. I get to do mine, but I haven't gotten to do it yet. But it's just such a cool experience. Like there's, you know, applications to go through and all that. And it's really just a cool way for people to introduce new ideas or share alternative opinions on old ideas. Yeah. So, you know, with that in mind, um, you are coaching individuals that have innovative ideas to share different uh, unique points of view. Um, what are maybe some of the recent uh, individuals that you've provided some coaching to? Do you have any one individual in mind that really st strikes you as, wow, that was a powerful one that I'll remember? I mean, everybody's got, it's, everybody has their own reasons for wanting to share what they share, right? And there was one speaker in particular who was a part of the group. I, he technically wasn't one of my own personal students in it, but I mean, you get to coach everybody as a group uh, at certain moments during rehearsals and whatnot. And there was one guy in particular who he owns a math academy and he's teaching children how to learn to love math as addictively as you would love a video game. And it's just turning an idea on 
on its head about, you know, something that to a lot of people is boring or hard or challenging or something and seeing him explain it and be able to showcase it in a way that makes it fun. And you can feel his energy and how much fun he believes it is. It's just, I mean, that's what it's all about is just seeing people get so excited about the thing that lights them up and then bringing these people in with them. Any idea like that is just a cool one, but that was a particularly cool one because people were literally gasping in the audience like, oh, really? It could be that easy? And then they just went crazy for it. It was such a cool idea. Yeah, and that's a unique perspective. I think that's a lot of what TED provides are unique perspectives. That's a lot of, uh, I think, what you provide as well as giving someone an opportunity to see an, uh, um, a topic from a different angle and find out for them what empowers them to talk about it. Uh, context is a word that I think is really important when it comes to communication. My context, the place in which I come from to provide content right now, Gina, is um, connection. COVID is making me really isolated. So when I come to these, I'm like so excited to connect with you, another adult, a human being, and hopefully to give something to viewers, which um, makes them feel like, okay, this is engaging. Um, so context, I think, is a really important part of communication. Tell me, what are your thoughts? How, how does this occur to you when you hear the word context? Yeah, I mean, context is such an important part of what you do. And I mean, from my point of view in the coaching that I do, I call it clarity. I call it clarity in the idea of like, no matter if you're writing a social media post, if you're doing a speech, if you're writing a book, no matter what it is you're creating, if you're not clear on the foundational takeaway that you want somebody to have, then we're not going to have the, the experience that you want us to have quite as powerfully as you're intending. So if you think, about you know being able to sum up the idea of what it is you do in your work or again if you're creating one of these mediums of a speech or a book or something like you need to be able to say it as clearly as one or two sentences so that no matter how far off the mark you go if somebody distracts you or if you start kind of talking about a different story and going off on a tangent you always know where to come back to and you can do so powerfully and clearly yeah. and not having that clarity really affects the way it'll land for somebody else yeah, that's right. You know, in my real estate business, the context in which I come from is that I am the conduit to reinforce trust and caring between human beings. Mm -hmm. And the, the only way I got there was by asking why. Why is a really great, great question I found in, in my coaching background. I've participated in kind of uh, coaching seminars. I know that's something you've also done. Um, when you ask why, that's a really great way to get to your context, your motivation. And for me, when I asked, why do I do real estate? And I went down the why kind of um, step. Of, yeah, yeah, that's right. It was, you know, to be an entrepreneur and make money. Uh, well, why is that important? Well, to help my family and I go down the whys. Well, actually the last why for me was to be a greater contributor to the world to reinforce trust and caring between human beings. What's your why? Why do you do what you do? Yeah, I love that question. And you're so right. The why is like the imperative part of everything. Uh, I do what I do because I want to give people a voice because I spent so long, you know, as the baby of the family growing up in this big boisterous Italian family, I didn't feel like I had a voice. I didn't feel like what I said mattered uh, to contribute it. And if I did, I had to do it very loudly and very aggressively. But what I've come to realize is that there is such power in showing up 100% authentically and vulnerably as me that what I say does matter, even if it's a reiteration of somebody else that somebody needs to hear it the way I say it. Somebody needs to hear it in the sort of metaphor or just the tone of voice that I'm using in order for that to really make an impact on their life. And for other people to have the strength and the courage and the clarity and to be engaging enough for their messages and their voices to truly land. That's what's most important to me is for other people to feel the confidence to be who they are, to share it proudly and loudly, and to actually have it make an impact in the world. Yeah. You know, these videos for me are a good practice, a good exercise of letting it all hang out. 
Um, I am someone that's not special. I'm a human being. I want to look good. I don't want to look badly. Yeah. Uh, I want my skin to look nice. I want to speak well. I want to be in a good posture. I want this interview to be incredible. And it's funny because as I do more of these, I realize um, what I do is I go inside my head and I'm having a conversation with myself. And part of communication, which is so powerful, has nothing to do with this and everything to do with this. Yep. Tell me, what is that, how does that, how has that made a difference for you and your relationships knowing that listening is the key? I mean, a lot of, again, why I feel like I have to share my voice is because I have, I mean, I have a very specific moment in my life where at the dinner table with my family, uh, I made some joke about, you know, a pillbox or something like, oh yeah, you're going to need one of those pillboxes, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever, you know, in a table that was quiet. So they should have heard me. And then 30 seconds later, my father said the same thing and the whole table started laughing. And it was a moment where I was just like, wow, no one's listening to me. And so I always make a very concerted effort to make sure I'm really hearing somebody because so much of what we say isn't what we say. It's how we say it. It's our body language. It's what we're not saying. There's all those little nuances to it, right? So yeah, the, the listening is such an important thing. Even giving a speech on a stage when you're the only one talking, you're still listening to the audience in front of you, seeing their body language. Are they getting up and walking out entirely? Or are they riveted on the edge of their seats waiting to hear more? That's still listening. It's a version of listening that we don't always think about. And having that experience to be able to open the door for somebody else to feel really heard creates this level of connection that is really hard to replicate. So when you make somebody feel like they're the only person in the room, I mean, they're going to feel connected to you in a way that they're not going to feel connected to the other person that they just met with the same amount of time, with the same amount of conversation, because they feel connected to you. They feel heard with you. They feel respected with you. All of those things that a lot of people don't feel they get maybe on a regular basis or at all. So that listening factor is such an integral part of you feeling connected to somebody else that then, you know, holds more weight with what it is that you can share with them moving forward. Yeah, yeah, it does. It also bridges a sense of relatedness really, really quickly. So quickly. Uh, whether for you or any of our viewers, it's about creating a personal relationship in your life or creating a business opportunity. Um, I found in real estate that the best way to do that is through listening and uh, through curiosity. Um, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to spend time with you, Gina, is because I'm so curious about you. You have so many parts of your world, and one of them in your in your uh, in your past is so cool. <laughs> Tell me about being an opera singer. What was yeah. that? I, I like to call myself a never has been opera singer as opposed to a has been. Because okay. I, I went to my undergrad to study being a performer. I've had voice lessons since I was 12 years old. I have an incredible talent for singing. Um, but what I neglected to take into account was that I actually have terrible performance anxiety on stage in front of a room. It really stresses me out to the point where I don't pursue opportunities. I wouldn't pursue opportunities. There was even one audition that I just didn't show up to because I was so scared. And I mean, I, I asked myself a lot of questions for a long time about like, okay, why did I pursue this line of work? If I knew this about myself, I just kind of like pretended it didn't exist. But also, why do I have this level of talent for something that I'm not meant to use, if that's true? And, you know, talking about going through that, that sort of leadership training with emotional intelligence and all of that, you know, through that process of asking why to myself, I discovered that it was just so much more about connection and message. And the, my favorite thing is to stand on a balcony and sing at a funeral because I'm giving something, creating ambiance and letting people feel something that they otherwise wouldn't have felt. And I'm the only person in that room that day that can possibly facilitate that emotional experience for them. So I'm actually writing my first book right now called Why I Love to Make People Cry. And that's a huge part of it is I love to make people cry because there is such power in knowing that you hit somebody so vulnerably and that they trust you enough to be vulnerable in front of you. And when I sing, people cry. Doesn't matter what I'm singing, doesn't matter where or why, 
they always cry. And that's something that I've learned now to replicate in just the way I communicate every day with people. Because I mean, if they'll cry in front of you, you know, you're connected to that person, you know, that you hit something a little bit deeper in them. So it was a long discovery of realizing that my time in music and being a classical singer was yes, of course, I love the music and I have an affinity for it. But those engagement skills and performance skills is something that now I can teach other people to do so that they are more engaging in their their lesson lands more powerfully, but it also creates that powerful connection in different ways, in marketing ways, even for their business. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So you know very intimately what it's like to have performance challenges. I know for me, where I'm at in this conversation is right now, as an interviewer, somebody who's only had, you know, a dozen or so shows, um, my performance aptitude, my ability, my own judgments about it. I am having anxiety, and the more I do it, the more comfortable I can't become. Um, but it also makes me more empathetic for those individuals, particularly guests that are not like yourself, that aren't feeling very comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so how has your performance anxiety, being a previous, you said failed opera singer, what was the word you used? Never has been. I never oh, has been. Has been. Uh, opera. <laughs> How, how has that experience created greater empathy for your clients and for the people in your life? Yeah, well, it's interesting because when I found I translated to a public speaker, I don't have that anxiety as a speaker because to me, I'm speaking is the easy part. Singing is the hard part, right? So I, I find that I can really, you know, commiserate and empathize with my clients who have that level of anxiety for speaking because I know very clearly that in front of a room singing, I, I know that same terror. It is the same experience, 100%. But I can teach them skills to help them feel more confident, to lead them through that fire and find it and to do it in a way that's really enjoyable for them. And one of the most powerful tools is really to just be yourself, to not try to be me up there, to not try to be you up there, but to truly just find the things that you are really strong at and the like your natural innate personality right. and just lean into those more because it's tough, oh, it's tough to be yourself though. Yeah. It is not an easy thing, especially in today's social media world. You know, as I'm creating more of these videos, I'm finding that uh, I'm trying to, I I'm keeping up with the Joneses in my own mind. Yeah. And that my authenticity is leaving me the more social media I consume, if that makes sense. I do. It does makes absolute sense. And that's the problem is that when we compare because we're like, oh, well, that works for them. But that's not who you are necessarily. Like I, when I have introverted clients, because I have many of those who are just terrified to get up in front of a room or do something like this, they're terrified. And I tell them, look, you don't have to be like me. You don't have to be super bubbly and, and jumping around on stage or singing on stage or anything like that. But what do you do really well? What gets you really excited? Going back to that why again, like remember why you're doing this because without you, that doesn't happen. And being able to find, way, like, you know, I've had one client in particular who's she's like a little socially awkward, right? But when we start leaning into the I, awkward as this like... Yeah, I, mean, I was going to say, like, when you lean into that as, like, a quirkiness and have some fun with it and kind of poke fun at yourself, it's so relieving for you. And for us, it's entertaining while at the same time, like, making you a little bit different, too. So it's just super interesting. Like, you just take your own sort of superpowers, I like to call them, and just find ways to lean into that and make it your own. Because, yes, that does work as maybe a best practice to do Facebook Lives. But don't do them that way just because that's how that person does it. They are very different from you. They have different fears, focuses, and, and ideas for what it is they're creating. But for you, totally a different thing. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really leaning into your innate personality, not, not shying away from things you're scared of so that you can, you know, retreat into the things that are comfortable, but truly just really, you know, leaning on those super things. Like you can be a soft spoken person and still be very empowering and engaging in front of a room full of people. You truly can. It's just a matter of knowing how you do that best. Sure. <laughs> I see Jenny's comment on Kira. Is that me? Am I the You're not the, the oh, socially awkward client. You are the, the soft spoken one, though, Jenny. <laughs> yeah, I just met Jenny for the first time yesterday when I dropped off um, some cookies for her and her family. And um, she's awesome. Uh, she Jennifer is. had made introductions to a couple of folks, yourself included, um, who I've had the chance to spend some time with. Mm -hmm. I 
am one of the like the awkward poster boys. My <laughs> wife shared with her friends. They asked her, "What's what's he like? This guy yours?" And she said, "Well, he's kind of awkward." And uh, well, yeah. she loves that about you. That's, That's why it's right. the first thing she loves it about you, right? So we get to learn to love that too, and like play it up in a way. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think my awkwardness as well as I've learned is that um, it is actually my authenticity. I speak to the core, and sometimes that cuts through a lot of layers, mm -hmm. and sometimes that creates situations that are uh, tense or highly emotionally charged mm -hmm. or just unpredictable. I didn't expect that. Um, it's not uncommon that I grow pretty close to my clients by being curious, um, being straight, but also being really sensitive. Mm -hmm. And as you do with your clients, I wear a lot of hats. You know, the real estate agent, the psychologist, the financial manager. Um, so yeah, that's that uh, this conversation is very real for me. I can see myself in this conversation. Yeah, good. I'm glad. Um, something I learned, which is a trip, uh, Gina. We lived three blocks from one another in New York City. That's right. Yeah, we did talk about that. Yeah, no, that's, that's crazy. I haven't lived there now in almost five years, but that's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, so I haven't lived there in three years. And uh, since you've moved from New York City to Columbus, mm -hmm. what do you notice that change has done for you both pro professionally and personally? Yeah, originally it was a personal choice to move. Uh, May 1st is actually my anniversary of moving four years then. And um, it, I needed space to do something different. I, I was somebody who, you know, if you have that conscious in your mind of like, you know, that voice speaking to you, a lot of people, it's their own voice telling them the awful things that tear them down and all that. Mine is my parents. Like my conscience in my head is my parents. And they all live in New Jersey where I grew up. And there was the part of me that at the time, because I didn't have ties to where I was in New York, I just felt like I needed to do something different and I needed space to figure it out. It wasn't that I was running away. I just felt like there was a closeness, a physical closeness that I couldn't really try my own thing until I had really like my own sea legs under me and didn't have them to necessarily catch me. And I didn't, I wasn't relying on them for a lot of things or anything like that. It was just some psychological sort of thing I needed to break through for myself. So having gone through that leadership training that we were talking about and moving here with a new community of people that I'd really never known before, like a month before that, I just feel like I needed to do something different to just try things a different way. And at the time it was actually to pursue music again. I was thinking of going back into music. But the connections that I've made, I mean, I really was committed to making connection. I felt so alone in New York. I, I was not feel on the couch every night, like ordering takeout two, three times a day because I was too low in energy to even make myself a bowl of cereal. Like I was just in a dark place emotionally. So moving here and making the concerted effort to say, I'm going to get to know people I'm going to see what connections I can make with other people that they may need and then just kind of see where that takes me. Now I'm at a point where four years later, I feel like I know half the city or at least we're two degrees of separation from everybody that we know. And it's just been such an invaluable tool, not only to the people that I meet and connecting them to other people, but I know that if I ever need somebody, I know exactly who to go to and where. And that level of connection that I've breeded with people, genuine connection, has led me to feeling not so alone. It's led me to have more confidence confidence to try new things and to do other things. And it's just been this cumulative effort to find what it is I'm doing now. So four years ago, it was more of like social media management and digital marketing consulting that I was doing. But now it's this communication coaching because I had the space to continue experimenting, to try new things, to really test what my limits were of being somebody as a, a person of influence. And I don't, I didn't feel like I had the space or the confidence to try being a person of influence when I was living back on the East Coast. I just didn't have... I didn't have the breathing room. I really felt constricted there for, for like I said, it's probably the familial reasons, but there may have been some other underlying things. And I just felt like I finally gave myself space to breathe. I think it's a good learning for um, people who do view this. And that is the story and the meaning we assign to things we made up and uh, proximity, the actual space between something 
uh, we make it up and how it impacts us. You know, mm -hmm. the, Nelson Mandela was in jail. The proximity to him in the outside world was pretty close, but he was still in jail, but he never felt imprisoned. Mm -hmm. He didn't allow the meaning of jail to impact his psychology. And I think it's a really good takeaway while I'm speaking with you, learning that environment is a big part of how we interpret things, the meaning we add to things. I'll give you an example. When I go to the office, I immediately feel differently. Because mm -hmm. the meaning I assign to going to the office is I'm about to go be productive and like mm -hmm. plug into my day. Yeah. The COVID thing is messing with me because I don't go into the office anymore. Yeah. Um, the Personally, the meaning that I assign and it's kind of a story is I'm not strong. Mm. That's my, that's my conversation. And that conversation was reinforced often being closer to family. And that's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. I think what you are ex experience is not uncommon. People are often held slave to their past. And a lot, a majority of that past is with family. Yeah. Um, do you find that to be the case in coaching your clients? how you can kind of piece together their past to create a bright, shiny future? Yeah, I mean, I love, what I do is actually a lot of mindset work, uh, believe it or not, with communication coaching. So yes, it's about marketing yourself and, and really having a great strategy to execute the thing you're trying to achieve. But there's so much mindset that has to go into it because if you don't have the confidence to show up for that strategy, it doesn't make a difference. Like it's not going to land the same way for people and it's not going to be effective. You're going to hate it. You're going to be miserable. So there's a lot of that. And it's, we dive into so much of the mental part of it. I remember one client in particular, I love this. He, he was having a really hard time with doing Facebook lives. Like he just felt really stodgy and uncomfortable. And, you know, he was trying to do the thing that we all do. You know, we set up a nice little background for ourselves and he's sitting in his chair and he's, you know, talking at the thing. And what he's saying is valuable. What he's saying is educational, but he just looked stiff. He felt stiff. He felt like he just hated the experience of doing it. And so it's like, okay, where can we find that you can be your best self in front of the camera so that we can start getting you more comfortable in a way of expressing yourself? And it doesn't have to be, you know, in this little box of what that looks like. And what we discovered was that in the car was the best moment for him. And he just felt most comfortable in the car, you know, just kind of holding his phone like this and, and talking into it and doing it that way. And the reason is because he realized that when he was a kid, as of the youngest of 12 kids, that was the only place he had individual one-on-one -on -one time with his father was like driving him to and from school or something like that. And then growing up, he would continue to have all of his phone conversations with friends and family and relationships on his commute to and from work. So like he created this habit for himself of learning that connection happens in the car. And it was just like this sort of mind blowing thing. He's like, oh my God, like, I can't believe that's a thing. And so once we knew that about him, he was able to practice doing Facebook lives that way, get comfortable doing that, and then grow into doing it in these other spaces with the pretty background, with the great setup of video and whatever, because he kind of used that as a crutch first. But if we didn't go into the mindset of why, like why, why is it in the car matter first? He understood that about himself enough to now grow from that. And it was a super fascinating sort of realization for both of us, actually. It was like, oh my God, that's so cool that that's where, where that was coming from for you because now we know and now we can do something with that information. Yeah, that's right. His environment set him up for success mentally and also yeah. created a feedback loop where he could see his performance was higher, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. if the product is better, you're enthusiastic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. What's your take on pain versus pleasure? Do your clients often take action as a result of avoiding pain or attaining pleasure? That's such an interesting question. I think our innate desire and our innate sort of reaction is to seek pleasure or over pain. I don't know. I have a dominatrix friend who maybe her clients will say otherwise, but <laughs> I think I think for the most part, people really do seek the pleasure over the pain. And I try to push people 
into spaces that are less pleasurable. I don't want it to be miserable for them because I don't want somebody to traumatize themselves with some sort of experience. But I do believe in having, like I said, that crutch sort of experience where it's something comfortable but pushes you. So it's something that's in a safe place. It's in a safe sort of container so that you can try new things, but you're not ultimately going to create an experience where you're never willing to try anything too challenging again. I, I can't create that for my clients personally. But for the most part, I think that's just an innate human sort of desire to avoid pain. And what I can do is kind of give them, and that's where that connection comes in really powerfully again, right? If they trust me, if they trust me enough to lead them into a space that is uncomfortable for them, then it feels less uncomfortable because they know that they can trust me, that I'm leading them in a place that's meant to be helpful. And okay, we'll reevaluate after that and see what that looks like. But I've, I'm really, really cautious to do so in a way that they trust, like they have to trust me first. Because if they don't, then they're just going to be resistant to it. And then that's going to create more pain in a different way too. Yeah. You know, that's very similar to what I do day in, day out with clients. Yeah, is that, sure. um, I am privy to many things in clients' lives that even their own family doesn't know about. Um, upcoming divorce, uh, having a child need a bigger house, downsizing, we lost a huge amount in our uh, um, investment accounts, uh, mm -hmm. financial situations, plans and vision for the future. Um, mm -hmm. And exactly like you said, that I really identified with that, which is you have to create that trust in order to move them through a space of learning and growth, awareness. What's really cool for me as a real estate let's call it consultant and coach yeah. when you hold the space for the person's learning mm -hmm. and then they learn it and you can see that the experience yeah. created an aha moment. And mm -hmm. that's a very distinct difference between telling someone something and then learning it versus them experiencing something and learning it. And the mm -hmm. impact to me is sometimes I have to be more patient. I might know where this is going, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter that I know. Mm -hmm. I have to allow this to unfold for them to experience it. And one of the ways that this specifically happens is the type of house my clients think they want. Mm -hmm. And I have a very strong kind of intuition about probably the house that would be a fit based on what you've told me you want for your life. Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, I again... Um, identify with the, the traits and the skills that you bring to your coaching business. It's really interesting the similarities that we have. Yeah, yeah. well, and I, I love that you bring that up because, I mean, when it comes to communication and marketing and all of that, I mean, there's a reason we tell our children fairy tales and stories to illustrate morals and lessons. It's because it sticks in your brain in a very different way versus just outright telling them. And we don't change as adults. It's always more effective to pull on the emotional heartstrings and really give a story and connection to the lesson. And what you're describing, you know, they have to experience it in order to really get the lesson and to understand it because, yeah, sometimes just outright telling you does not compute. <laughs> it just doesn't. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. So I, I'm sure you bump up against that with your own clients mm -hmm. who, you know, they're, they're fighting to see the light and they're listening, but they have to go through something. And the only way to do that is through trusting you. Um, so professional, um, you know, your pursuits in coaching, just putting that aside for a moment, mm -hmm. what are you reading at the present time? You seem like a very well-read person. Yeah, but do you have anything? In, do you have anything in particular that you're either reading or content that you regularly consume? Yeah, I'm always reading, um, and I actually just made a post about this earlier today. That sometimes I get sad thinking about the fact that I'll never read all the books I want to, no matter how long I live. <laughs> like it's just so sad to me that my list keeps growing. Uh, I'm currently reading The Power of Focus. It's a thicker one, so I've been taking a longer time to get through it. But it's just so. It's an older one. It's from like early 2000s, I think. Um, and it's Jack Canfield and Les Hewitt and, and one other guy. But it's just so like tangible action steps for you to have more focus in whatever it is you're doing. And I love that. I love having actionable steps with the stories to go with it. Um, but yeah, I love reading. I, I, I'm not a huge podcast listener. I love them and I love being on them. But I don't commit to listening to them nearly as much. But The School of Greatness is like 
my be all end all because it's just every type of topic under the sun. Um, and they have a lot of really great, powerful guests on there and seemingly random ones too, which I love. So those are like my popular ones, but I'm, I'm always reading something. My Amazon like list, I have a reading list on there specifically for, all right, what's next? What's next? And I, and I read about a bunch of different stuff too. And I find it's very helpful to have that sort of background information for the people that I'm coaching. So the more I read and learn about miscellaneous things, it's surprisingly helpful with clients for, for reasons that don't even make sense by the time I'm reading it. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, wait, I actually have to pull that out later and be able to coach somebody through that for whatever reason. So it's, yeah, I find it's it's one of my favorite pastimes, but it's actually super helpful for my credibility and my, my teaching. Sure. Plus it shifts the way in which you view the world when you get to hear somebody else's take, um, I am reading, or excuse me, just read Chris Voss. He is a former FBI lead hostage negotiator. Yes, I think that's on my list too, yeah. Yes, and um, it's never split the difference. And I just used his techniques recently when yeah. purchasing a product through Facebook Marketplace and um, all I will say to those folks who are interested in the book, uh, consider questions that you ask. Stay away from why questions, whether it be with your spouse and business, and stick to what and how questions. You'd be so surprised how mind control starts with what and how questions. So <laughs> I was using some of those with my wife, and um, what I what I found. Gina, is that I had less defensiveness when I stayed away from why-based questions. It was a really interesting learning. Yeah, confrontation often comes from the escalation of emotion. So if you can find a way to keep that from happening, then that's a great way. And I see a comment from Chris here. Uh, do you like real books or eBooks? I personally prefer real books. I love like hardcover journals and I can read eBooks, but I look at a computer most of the day. So I wanna give my eyes a break and actually hold a physical book personally. I don't yeah. know about you, Mark, what do you think? Um, I like the eBook because I don't, want to fill my space with tangible books. Oh, no, um, my dilemma. <laughs> I, I've kept a couple of very, very um, choice books here in the corner. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, I don't like stuff, uh, number one. And number two, um, I find that my hands are more comfortable doing that versus mm -hmm. flipping a book like that. I will sell, I say with this caveat, however, that the brain doesn't absorb information through, um, doesn't absorb information as well through e-readers and digital. Mm -hmm. The tactile, the smell of a book, the, when you actually hear the sound of a page turning, mm -hmm. the fact that the spine of the book changes as you get deeper into the book and that you can more easily open it up. These very, very nuanced characteristics change how we learn and absorb information. So without a doubt, I think you're probably on track with using tangible books. Um, well, when I go to the library, I don't buy every single book. Oh my God, I would be broke if I bought every single book that I wanted to read. So I, I go to the library like I've, because I know in my life in the past couple of years, minimalism has become important to me because the future vision is to actually live on a school bus and travel the world, which Amazing. is not have a huge bookcase. Yeah, I'm not going to have a huge bookcase in a school bus. So I've, I've been paring down as I go sort of thing, buying less actual physical books. So the library has been a great resource. I don't think there's a single book like especially since in this personal and professional development, even the new ones, there's not much that they don't have. Maybe it's already checked out or something because they don't have a ton of copies, but I'm, I'm always surprised at how much they actually do have. So go to your local, local library. <laughs> yeah, I love um, one app in particular called Libby. Mm. Libby is an app for those folks out there. You download it on your uh, device, be it an iPad or cell phone. And uh, if you have a library card, it uh, connects to your library card and gives you the opportunity to rent books from your library, many of which are brand new books that have recently hit the bookshelves. So um, if it's not available, you get to you get placed in a digital waiting line. Um, and that's another resource, an easy way for you to read books by using Libby, L-I-B-B-Y. Um, tell me something about health and wellness. Where have you had a transformation in health and wellness? Because I know we talked about this and I, I just, 
I have to, I have to have you let people know <laughs> what you've managed to do in your life. Yeah, thank you. So the my entire life, I struggled with my weight. I grew up in a family that really loved food, and it was a very social tool, and it was a reward, and all of those things. So my weight is something I've really struggled with my entire life. And it was two thousand, the end of two thousand eighteen, where I really finally something clicked for me. And I was able to really start a journey to taking better care of my body. Cause I mean, it was never, I mean, obviously there's a lot of self-esteem issues and body dysmorphia. And I had been through an eating disorder. I'd been in outpatient therapy for, um, or outpatient rehab, I should say twice for binge eating as well as bulimic behavior. And it was just, I never had a strong and healthy relationship with food, but it was the end of 2018 where I really started to dive into that in a way where it was my own doing. It wasn't like a trainer, a nutritionist, any of that. I've tried all of those things thousands of times and they wouldn't stick because what I've discovered about myself is that I can follow rules really, really well, but left to my own devices, I really struggle. And so I knew that, you know, even though 10 years ago, I worked with a trainer and lost like 50 pounds. I gained all of that back and plus because I wasn't able to maintain it on my own. There was just something mentally that wasn't clicking. So since that time at the end of 2018, I've lost about 70 pounds, although through coronavirus right now, I've gained some back, I'm not gonna lie. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I still have a long way to go, but what's been very valuable is number one, my, my boyfriend is also on a similar journey. So we kind of keep competitive with each other, which for me is really helpful because I we're just competitive people. Um, but it's also, just been something where it's like okay finding stuff I enjoy doing like I like going for walks and hikes we went out for a hike the past Saturday like the past month even through all this coronavirus stuff like I like doing that and not trying to force myself kind of like we're talking about with marketing right like I'm not forcing myself to do the thing that other people say works for them or that they like doing because I'm miserable and I won't maintain it so finding you know new foods that I like and proper portion controlling when it is things I really like but are super you know high in calories whatever is um, just really focusing on developing new habits, being patient, be, with it being a longer term process. Because at this point, you know, by the time of this recording, that's a little bit, almost a year and a half of that behavior. And it's, I still got a long way to go in my mind for what my goal is. But I mean, it, it's not going to happen overnight. It didn't happen overnight to get me here. So I have to be patient with myself and creating those new habits and finding what I truly enjoy. Because my vision is not to be a gym bunny the rest of my life. I don't like going to the gym, but I do like swimming. I do like kayaking. I do like hiking and all of those other things that can just be a part of my life. They don't have to be like active, intentional. Okay, I'm going to go work out now. To me, that doesn't work. So knowing that about myself, learning that about myself has really made all the difference. And I mean, yeah, I still struggle. Like I said, through coronavirus time, I've gained back probably maybe 10 pounds. Um, but it's just a matter of knowing that about myself and not beating myself up about it, which I used to do, which kind of just threw me off the wagon entirely as opposed to, you know, just getting off it, but then hopping back on. Yeah, sure. You know, I identify with what you're talking about in terms of the relationship I have with food. Mm -hmm. Sweets. Oh, my God, Gina. It's <laughs> It's embarrassing. I have to hide it, and my wife has to hide sweets from me. Mm -hmm. I can sit in front of cookies. I had an open house. The mm -hmm. homeowner was so sweet. Hey, Mark, I've, I left out some cookies. Feel free to enjoy, you know, have guests come. Um, in, on that particular day, um, I think it was early COVID, uh, mm -hmm. guests did not show up understandably. So here I am with a plate of cookies. I almost finished the entire box. I believe it. <laughs> I'm that I'm that guy that I eat myself till I feel sick. Yeah. Um, just to share with you, one of the transformations I had um, was my relationship to alcohol. Mm. So I never had an issue with alcohol. In fact, I didn't even drink that much. Mm. But what it produced was a feeling of low energy, low spirit, depression, anxiety. And I had an instance about three and a half years ago where I saw a family member, they got really banged up drinking. I saw what it did to them. And then the next day I could see how it affected their mood. And mm -hmm. something about that for me was a turning point. And I haven't drank in like three plus years. And it's an interesting thing because, um, how people hear that is that I had a problem, a drinking problem. Yeah. For me, it didn't need to be a problem for me to see the opportunity that if I did this, something would shift. And as a result, um, 
there's less depressive feelings, higher spirit. I wake up with energy. I don't have headaches. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't really miss it. I don't like last night, for instance, I, uh, I had a long day. It was a really long day. And I said, you know what? I'd love a beer. I would love a beer. And then I was like, isn't the same thing as seltzer? So I had a seltzer and I was like, ah, oh, that hit the spot. Like, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So that's awesome. You, you've really transformed yourself in, in so many areas of life. I think clearly you're an inspiration for me, for your clients. Um, I mean, people are chiming in, one of which who is your client. Um, yeah. <laughs> during COVID, and we'll close with this, um, mm -hmm. what would you like or what do you suggest that people do for themselves? during this period of uh, a stressful, isolating time, what's something that people can do for their themselves, their own health and well-being, mind, body, spirit? Yeah, so I participated in this challenge called 75 Hard last year, and it's, you know, this 75 days of these pretty strict habits, uh, one of which is you get to do two workouts a day of 45 minutes each, one has to be outside. And I have to say that growing up as a city and suburban girl where like I had to drive pretty much anywhere I needed to go for the most part, except New York, obviously, there is something about being outside, no matter the weather, no matter if it's raining, snowing, heat, like it doesn't matter what it is, unless it's dangerous, obviously don't do that. But there is something about being outside, even just going for a walk around the neighborhood that changes you. And if you're feeling like you're in a shit mood, if you're feeling like there's just, you know, there, there's grogginess, like that emotional and energetic grogginess. Maybe it's not mental, maybe it is, but there, there's something about it that just feels like pent up. Even right now with everything going on, you can still go outside for a walk for a little bit. And doing so, even you know, today it's pouring rain out, like I intend on going out for a walk because it does change you. There's something about being outside that really does support your mental and emotional health. And if you're going through stuff or if you're not and you're just in a good mood, like think about how good it is to just get out there and know you did something today. You moved your body and just kind of getting all that energy moving around in you is just enough sometimes to change your perspective on certain things. And even though you don't want to, I'm not saying you're always going to want to do that, even when you like know that about yourself. I mean, I, I know that this is something that supports me at this point and there's sometimes I don't want to but then I go and I'm happy and I'm like, all right, yeah, that was, that was just the thing. It's kind of like a little, you know, a little pill you can take, except not a pill. You could just can do it. But, um, but that's been such a game changer for me is to know that being outside in some fashion really is something that can just completely flip the script on my day if I go and do it. And it doesn't matter how long it is. It could be 10, 15 minutes, but it's super, super helpful. Awesome. Awesome. Gina Mo Molinari. I so enjoyed my time with you. The time flew by. I mean, it's, 47 minutes. Um, <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> you, um, plug your business and where people can find you online, email, phone, website. Please share that now. Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on my website is ginamolinari.com. And I spend my most time on Facebook. So facebook.com slash the Mo. And I alluded to the book that I'm writing. You can pre-order it on my website as well. So just check out the store on there. But yeah, those are the best places to, to reach me. Awesome. Gina Mo, you're an inspiration, a great contributor to uh, me, to our viewers, to your clients. And uh, while we haven't spent time in person, I do feel that connection, that love, and uh, I appreciate you. Well, thank you. I appreciate you, too. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. All right, Gina Mo. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Elias from New Albany Realty, and we will see you soon on the next broadcast. Bye-bye.